Thank you very much, Sheila. It's lovely to uh, come back to Oxford. First met uh, Sheila at um, graduation ceremony in Oxford Brooks uh, in last uh, last summer. That was a uh, lovely occasion. So nice to be, be back in Oxford. I've I've come from the other place um, over in Cambridge, so I won't mention that too often uh, in the uh, in the present company. Um, my background is I'm the uh, coordinator for the Computing at School Group, uh, which I'm trusting. If you haven't heard about uh, beforehand. Uh, you'll be sick of by the time I by, by the time I finish. Um, I think I have about how long have I got? Round about you, you say round about an hour. Or so. an hour yeah. You know I might I might stop earlier, but please do do stop me at any point if you if you wish to uh, ask questions about what's going on in schools, what the uh, school teachers have got um, have, 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 have got to face uh, in September. As I say, I'm the kind of coordinator of computing at school. I've been a teacher for 25 years. I'll probably touch a little bit later on uh, on my particular background, um, but it's an unusual background in terms of uh, education, um, in that I, uh, my, my ambition when I was five was to be a songwriter and musician, and that was all I ever wanted to do. I kind of wanted to be up on John's keyboard player. I thought that was my uh, ambition. I hadn't quite worked out when uh, I was five, and it's quite a good keyboard player already, so maybe therefore my services may not be needed. Um, but I went through school, I did a music degree, and I started teaching music in, in, in schools, ending up as head of music in a variety of schools in, 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 in different places. In my late 20s, early 30s, I began to lose my hearing. Come on, I'll give you a little bit of a good story. So if you do uh, want to speak to me, uh, I'm very difficult, I'm very difficult probably kind of locating sound. So I do need a protocol to be uh, established here that we use in, in schools. So please give me a physical signal that you want to speak. I find that very, very helpful. Um, but uh, late 20s, early 30s, I realised they weren't too sure how deaf I was going to become. Um, thankfully, it's not so deaf, although I wouldn't be able to function without, uh, without um, hearing aids. Um, but I said to my headmaster at the time, um, look, this is the situation. We don't know what the prognosis is. Consultants don't know quite how deaf I will be uh, by the time I'm in the 40s. I'm now <coughs> well past mid 40s, I'm sad to say. Uh, but I'm going to need to change subjects. I don't know what it's going to be. I gave them a choice, one of which happened to be computer science, because I was quite into music technology. And so the composing that I did and still do uh, was usually um, right into a computer somewhere. Uh, and that was my uh, use of computer. But all I understood about uh, computers. I'm afraid I wasn't one of those people. Um, that gets too misty eyed about the BBC. Brief. I never owned one. I never touched one. That wasn't my that wasn't my world. All I wanted to do was play the piano and sing and um, write music. Um, a few months later, the head called me into his office and said, "Look, well, the second in the maths department is, is leaving, and he did a few uh, lessons of A level computing." And he said, "Would you like his um, A level computing classes in September?" Oh, all right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Why not? Let's give that a go. Um, and I literally knew absolutely nothing. And so I do empathise deeply with those teachers who, when they look at perhaps the new computing curriculum, uh, look at it and think, I don't know this. I've no idea. And of course, in those days, it wasn't possible to kind of just say to me, oh, there's plenty of courses online. Uh, you can go and do a Coursera course or Udacity or any number of these online courses. They'll teach you how all, all this stuff. That's fine. That wasn't. That wasn't around. What I did need was somebody to kind of hold my hand, somebody that I could go to who knew this stuff. So when I was reading the textbook, I didn't understand, you know, what is this normalization of floating point numbers? Uh, what, what's a floating point number, let alone the normalization of floating point numbers? He was able to kind of talk me through it and explain at my pace in language that I could understand. And having somebody alongside me just to help was something that I found remarkably useful. And that's something which, as we've developed the computing at school group um, over the last five or six years, is something I've held on to uh, very dearly. And it's what we are really trying to build within computing at school, is that network of experts to help and support uh, the teachers uh, in the classroom. So rather long extended introduction to myself. Um, I want to give a little bit of history lesson. This is going to be very easy for you folks, I feel absolutely sure. But a little quiz. Uh, who? Thank you. I can't hear. Protocol, please. Lady Ada. Sorry. Lady Ada. Lady Ada. Ada Lovelace, of course. Uh, supposedly, they say, uh, the first programmer with the work that she was doing with, uh, doing with Babbage. Okay, can you name those two ladies? Oh, no, sorry, I mean, 
Well, I've said that too, too hard. Well. Um, but I'll, um, uh, the computer. Come on, sis. Very much. This is going nice and nice and well. Should have brought, brought a few Mars bars. <laughs> this one? Manchester one? The Manchester, the, the, the Manchester baby, absolutely right. First store program computer, a uh, whopping 128 bytes of memory. That was quite a memory, I'm sure. Uh, you're all familiar. Well, the, the clue is there in the picture, but what's the yeah. significance? Yeah. Yeah, well, just commercial computers with, with lions, uh, tea houses, uh, of course. And then, and then, then at this point, you know, we all get a little, we, I've already de de declared that I, that I, I, I didn't, um, get a little bit kind of misty eyed of those halcyon days with the personal computer uh, being introduced. Because this was an advert that was in the, uh, I, I, believe it was the it, I believe it was in the Observer in 1982. Because what was fascinating, as I'm sure you will remember, that you, you, you got given the hardware, but along, alongside the hardware, you've also got these books, programmers' guides and reference books about how you actually got the thing to do something. And you actually had to interact with it, and you had to program it before it would do anything uh, for you at all. Um, because the, kind of the key principle that was being operated here was that these computers were to be put into the hands of the children at weekends for them to play, to discover, to create, and to explore. All good things, I think, that we would want to be instilling in our, in our, in our youngsters today. And perhaps the Raspberry Pi uh, is, a, is, a, is a similar piece of kit where it's aimed to get it into the hands of the children and to kind of relive some of that, uh, some of that experience. We jump forward about the best graphic I could uh, find for this, but really the idea of this graphic is that well, in those days, perhaps it was only a few who got hold of the uh, hold of the kit, and even a smaller number uh, who actually could work their way through the programmer's guide and understand what it all actually meant, and were then able to put it all together. I did actually spend some time with uh, old magazines, you know, tapping in lines of code. I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. I was simply just copy. Uh, it, it meant nothing to me, but eventually did get something to move around on the screen, but sadly it was, it was lost on me. But of course today with uh, our youngsters and your children and those that you know uh, of teenagers, their life is full of technology, is full of digital devices. As somebody was saying to me today uh, uh, earlier on over, over, over coffee, holding up their smartphone and saying that the power inside these devices is so much greater than we ever had. So much greater than the, than the computers that put Neil Armstrong on the moon, of course, and we've used them for playing Flappy Birds. Uh, but it's all, um, every uh, device, Xboxes, Playstations, our digital world is ubiquitous. Um, and it's an interesting uh, issue that we have that moment uh, today, yet, as we look back over the last decade or so, we discover that our youngsters have been voting with their feet as far as wanting to study computer science and their digital world. Um, uh, I've got numbers up here until 2010, so it's a little bit out of date. Uh, we find a little bit of a levelling off now, but this is computing A-level uh, entries uh, year uh, on year, and it's rather interesting um, case. Also, for university entries, numbers over a similar period have fallen by 50%. So there's clearly something wrong. But we're all fascinated by our digital devices, we're all using our digital devices, yet wanting to know how they work is lost on us. Something must be, uh, must be wrong. Uh, I won't draw too much attention, of course, to the, uh, to the lower line, um, the, the red line here, um, but it is rather fascinating, and I forget the exact that, that stats, but it was something like 240 girls to pay on computing last year. I don't know how many seats we've got in this, in this small room, but you could probably put all the girls who took A level computing in this room. That's staggering, isn't it? Absolutely staggering. And the number of those girls who've got A's, well, there might just be room in the, in, in, in the, in the toilets. <laughs> <laughs> really, something, something is seriously wrong with the way in which we are communicating about our wonderful subject computer science and the magic and the beauty that is there. Something is clearly uh, going amiss. And then we said a little bit of the context here with some real numbers. 
and think and compare gears, this again is all A level uh, figures, uh, with, with mathematics. So back in 2002, 28,000 computer science uh, A level um, candidates. ICT didn't exist in those days, but the year later uh, it did. And so inevitably we see some of those students who were doing A level computer science move over into ICT. That's right, and that's good to have that as a, as a valid option. By that time, 56,000 students were doing, doing maths. We can see the number of maths students has steadily uh, increased, and the number of those doing computer science has just steadily decreased. Something is clearly going wrong within our education system, within our schools, to help children understand their world <coughs> and inspire their curiosity about the subject. So here's an interesting quote. By the second part of the quiz, we know who wrote it. Seymour Kaffer. Well done, Seymour Seymour Kaffer. Very good. Okay, thank you. Uh, in my vision, the child programs the computer and in so doing both acquires a sense of mastery of a piece of the most modern powerful technology and establishes an intimate contact with some of the deepest ideas from science, from math, from the art of intellectual model building. We've heard a lot in the uh, in the press of late about coding or programming. We'll just regard those two terms as not let's not open up that, uh, that, that debate for a moment. And we've certainly heard um, you know, in the newspapers and on the television that it just seems to be about we're going to be teaching our children how to code, and that seems to be the be all and end all. But I want to argue that it's not the be all and end all. In much the same way that when I was teaching music, I certainly wasn't teaching the children how to play musical instruments so that they would one day um, join up on the desks of the London Symphony Orchestra. That wasn't the purpose. There was a deeper purpose. Of course we could make music. Of course we play music. That was the catalyst. That was the fun bit to actually make and perform and compose. But we were teaching melody and rhythm and harmony and form and, and, and tone and style and history and process and collaboration. All those other very important fundamental concepts and un understanding of music. And the same way within, within the new computing curriculum, it's not just about coding. I certainly do hope that the teachers would, would grapple with programming and actually get the students to do some because those are the, the, those that have done and do and those of you that are their living, you're, you're living by doing it will know it's actually so much fun. And it's an, one of the most creative activities uh, that we can get any of our children to do. But on the side, I'm also going to say this, but I think it's important. I also think it's one of the only uh, activities where failure is a given. You know that experience. You type a bit of code in, back comes the compiler, syntax error, I fail. What do you do about it? You've got to get over that and you've got to study and think and debug and learn what did I do wrong here? And then work that through with the different types of errors. I don't really get that. Even if a child has played a, played a melody to me, they think, well, that's not It's really, really good. It doesn't fail. That might be an awful melody, but actually, he doesn't want to encourage them. But actually, the, the computer sometimes doesn't want to encourage them. It just comes back, syntax error online, whatever it was. You know, you too well. The syntax error probably wasn't on that particular line, it was somewhere else. And you've really got to investigate and develop your thinking patterns to work out where it actually gone, gone wrong with it. And this is kind of what uh, Papert was, 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 was getting at. That, this, that, the, that the methods and the uh, uh, processes that you go through as a result of programming is something that actually is so rich and will benefit a number of other disciplines, not just uh, computer science. So CAS formed back in uh, 2008. There were four of us um, in a room. I had been seriously worried. I was teaching A-level uh, computing at Hills Road Sixth Form College in Cambridge, uh, where it has the dubious reputation. There's only five, um, the, no, not only five, there are five named schools uh, that provide more than 50% of the students to get into either Oxford or Cambridge. Four of them are private schools, and the last one is Hills Road uh, State Form, State Form College. So the bright kids in my class. Um, and it was rather worrying to me when I sort of was comparing the world that I had as a head of music, where children have been learning music since they emerged into the world, quite frankly. Both through primary school and junior school and secondary school, GCSEs and so on, there was a kind of established curriculum all the way through. I found it very weird then finding myself teaching a level computing where they hadn't done any GCSE, they'd done nothing uh, before. I mean, many of the students who were there doing that A level were actually there because they hadn't done anything before and they seriously wanted to know more about their digital world and I applauded that. 
but then would find with some of my brightest students, um, you know, they'd come to Oxford, want to come to Oxford or Cambridge or Imperial or some of the top universities, and I'd say, well, don't bother doing your own level because actually they don't want it. Absolutely weird. Another kind of personal story, when I started my music degree, sorry, I won't walk on that, just, just, just don't be, but I my music degree, one of the um, uh, subjects we had to learn was keyboard harmony. Now, the idea of keyboard harmony is that you put a, uh, in the early phases, maybe a kind of a Haydn or a Mozart string quartet on top of the piano, and so you've got four clefs, the viola plays mainly in the alto clef, um, and you and the would key, and you'd have to work out how to play that uh, on the piano. And then you'd go forward and think, well, now you've got a Beethoven symphony in front of you, and you've got all 36 instruments in last the clefs, you then have to transcribe that for the answer the piano. It's quite an advanced skill. I wasn't very good at it, but it's a pretty really advanced skill. That was year one. Now, what happens in many of our undergraduate courses, um, and so the criticism of those who work in Canada, before I offend people who are different universities, work in universities, I can almost speak for you. Do put me wrong. But a lot of the university courses kind of introduction to programming because the students haven't done any beforehand. And yet we're showing all over the country now that actually many of our seven year olds who get a handle on some of the basic constructs of programming, the principles of programming, excited by it. So by the time they reach you at 18, boy, you should be able to do some really exciting, um, I can't say hesitantly to, to use the word sexy, but let, 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 let's go with some real sexy computer science when they hit you at, at undergraduate level. And this was the, my, my world that I was facing, teaching A-level computing, thinking, well, the university don't need to do this A-level, so you know, don't bother, and we're really missing such an opportunity. So I gathered together uh, with also my colleague who works very close with me in um, computing at school, uh, Simon Peyton Jones, who some of you will no doubt have heard of, he's a researcher at, uh, at Microsoft, and he's been hugely influential in the developments of the, uh, the new curriculum and behind, behind CAS. And one of the fundamental things we thought, we want to see computer science recognized as a school subject, a school discipline. So it sits alongside history and geography and so on. And it's quite separate from the very useful skills of digital literacy. Let's not get over the fact we do need our children to understand how to use the technology sensibly, responsibly, and carefully. But there's something deeper and there's something richer that we should be covering. Then there is a bit of a history lesson of the last, uh, what's been going on about the, the last five years. It's a very influential report um, that was put out by the Department of Culture, Media, Sport. I'm sure they've got something else. I mean, Ed Basie was the uh, at the time. Uh, really looking at the, and coming up from the games industry, the visual effects uh, industry, a couple of guys called Ian Livingston, um, who was behind uh, Lara Croft, Tomb Raider, now chairman of IDOS, and Alex Hope, who was um, CEO or vice CEO of um, um, Games Company, or visual effects company. Uh, anyway, and their, 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 their report that came out uh, had this as their first recommendation. Hurrah. Good. Something that the government can then get their teeth into and listen to. And then it was back in 2011, it seems like, a, it seemed like an age ago, um, and this really did put the cat amongst the metaphorical pigeons, when, when somebody from across the water uh, says to our government ministers, you've got your education system wrong, well, they get a bit, oh, I'm not sure, I'm sure about that, you know, what, can we, what, what can we do with that? So Eric Schmidt, chairman of, of, of Google, um, you know, flabbergasted, to learn that today computer science isn't, isn't even taught as standard. And yet, as we saw in the photographs earlier on in the first few slides, we're world leaders, and have always been world leaders in the field of computer science. What on earth has gone wrong? Why are you not teaching the richness of your heritage to your, to, to your youngsters? He's right to be uh, flabbergasted. Your IT curriculum focuses on teaching how to use rather than how it is made. And the understanding of that technology is something which is absolutely critical. And so our uh, Minister of Education, uh, Michael Go, you know, did pick up that did pick up did, did pick up that message back in uh, 2012. He gave an interesting speech at the Vet Show to Technology Education uh, Trade Fair in, in, in London uh, every year. And these are a little bit of extracts that I quite liked from his speech where he's recognizing quite rightly that computer science is a rigorous, fascinating, and intellectually challenging subject. I'm sure we wouldn't disagree with that. 
But this was another really interesting bit. We will consider including computer science as an option in the English baccalaureate. It's kind of a performance measure uh, where um, all schools will then be governed based on a, a, a narrow range of subjects, English, math, science, and so on. They will then be regarded as being good or bad or indifferent uh, according to their um, pass rates in the English baccalaureate. And it was a bit of a fortress. It was one of those things that Goethe was particularly passionate about and particularly keen on, and he had a very clear idea of what was going into that English baccalaureate, and it really was a fortress. We were told by the DfV sometime before, this is no way you're going to persuade the DfV to get another subject into the English baccalaureate. It was fascinating here in 2012. It was as if the drawbridge was just being wound down just a little bit. There was a glimmer of hope, a chink of light. The door was ajar, and we, and we ran in there as fast as we possibly could. It is now part of the English Baccalaureate. Our world has changed. Those of us who were at school and regard science as being physics, chemistry, biology, know it's now four. It's physics, chemistry, biology, computer science. There are now four sciences in the school group. That's fascinating. It has changed. And the English Baccalaureate is one of those uh, interesting areas. And he also got hold of it absolutely, I think, that whilst individual technologies change, they're underpinned by the foundational concepts and principles that have endured for decades. The smartphone that I was shown earlier, the kind of the architecture of what's going on inside those machines and how you program those devices, it's not that dissimilar to how you program devices back in the 1950s. It's a similar principles going on. You know, let's teach some of those principles that we can apply that to whatever device we happen to be wanting to get to work uh, for us. The principles learned in computer science will still hold true. And this is one of the failings that we've seen in our, in our school systems where we were teaching children how to use particular software packages when they were 12 by the time they did the workplace. Just moved on so fast. And we, uh, we haven't been giving them that mental model of computation, how these things are put together to help them understand and navigate and move between uh, different applications. And the last, I think the last uh, report, last kind of key moment, the Royal Society uh, got behind it, had a great privilege of being part of the panel for the, uh, for the Royal Society. Uh, so the DFE should remedy the current situation. You've got to do something. Put your finger out. Something has to be done. You can't go on at the moment with such a skill shortage that we have in our IT industry. We can't go on with the university um, uh, admissions are falling through the floor. Something has to change. Good schools are disincentivized from teaching computer science. We need to reform and rebrand the current ICT curriculum in England. Schemes of work should be established for ages 5 to 14 across the range of computing aspects and identify three separate components digital literacy, information technology, and computer science. That is a hugely uh, important uh, aspect. I'm going to run through these few slides. I don't need to tell you what computer science is. You know it. Um, but I've just highlighted there a uh, kind of buzzword at the moment that's, that, that's floating around. Uh, it's often hard. We're getting there closer, I think, to actually come on. What do we actually mean by computational thinking? What is the definition? But it's kind of part and parcel of what I was trying to describe earlier on. Um, it's my kind of half-hearted attempt at some notion of this, is that I would come across a child and I would know they'd be music. I'm not sure if I could actually define and say why I knew they were a musical child, but there was something in them that I knew, yeah, got it, pennies have dropped here. And so there was some sense, a similar thing with the computational thinking. We know when we account as students, yeah, you've got it. I really want to encourage you. But we need, as we do with all, all music, with, 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 all, with music in schools, give the opportunity to try this stuff. Others will never find out if they're musical or not. Let's give our children the opportunity to explore computational thinking, just so that we can then identify them, pick them up and run with them and support them, and hopefully, fundamentally, not get in their way. So we teach disciplines, technology and skills. You know, that's uh, <laughs> fairly straightforward, uh, we we'll think. We want to focus as much on the discipline as we do on the technologies where I think we've gone wrong uh, in the past. Things that children should know, you'll recognize some lists of languages and algorithms, data structures, architecture, data representation, programs, communication, and so on and so forth. But also, what should they be able to do with this computational thinking, how they put it into practice? They understand when they're abstracting a problem, what they're modeling. The process of design and problem solving, and of course, programming uh, is key. Uh, is key there as well. 
I've mentioned it's not just coding, it is certainly not just to get a good job. Uh, I'm said uh, often at meetings such as this that for me, the picture I have in my mind is of that 14 year old pupil who decides not to take computer science. That's why I want this new career. So despite the fact we have all these skills, shortage, despite the fact we have students not undertaking computer science degree courses at the moment, it seems, I still want us to picture that 14 year old. If we have a good, solid curriculum that, has been, that, that this child has been studying for their previous 10 years since they first entered the school, I want them to have a, mon a mental model of computation uh, that would then, when they enter the workplace, two years, four years, seven years later, will still hold true. Now clearly, if we have got that good curriculum, we will get students want to do the GCSE, and then want to do the AL, and then want to go, go, go on to do computer science and so on at the university. But I think that would be a sign effect. I want this curriculum to be for that 40 year old who decides to drop it, computing. Uh, as I did when I, when I dropped physics when I was 40. What mental model did I take forward of my physical world? I'm sure you're probably all those who work, when I'm studying physics beyond me will know, well, you've got an imperfect model. Yeah, sure, because actually we don't tell the whole story uh, to youngsters about, about science, but we give them enough of that mental model that they, they, they can then, uh, then take forward. So that's my the second point there. It's not just to get a good job, that's it. But it's not just for that. And it's not just code we mentioned now. I mentioned the fourth science. We mentioned the ubiquity of it. It's, it's rooted in ideas, not in the technology. We want to try and get away from that. But there's no doubt that it's, it's problematic, I think, for many um, teachers at the moment if they don't understand the computer science fully. Um, to think, well, you've already heard of the programming language Scratch, which is uh, all over the uh, schools at the moment. It's a wonderful, wonderful um, piece of software, absolutely superb. Uh, but I do fear that whilst many of our children have had uh, death by PowerPoint over the years, uh, as I'm giving you this evening, uh, perhaps they will be as good as death by Scratch in the future. I certainly hope not. There's a role for us to kind of help the teachers understand what it is they're actually teaching. It's not about the end product. It's about the journey that they've taken from getting from that initial idea, how they articulate that idea in their in, in, in their solution, and how they can do that, uh, how they can do that better. Sure. Sorry. Good. What's STEM? STEM: Science, Technology, Engineering, and Maths. So we have the uh, the notion of STEM subjects. And we notice there that the one that's missing is computer science. There is no computer science in STEM subject, but of course we all know there's a hell of a lot of, of, of computer science in science and in technology and in engineering and in maths, kind of the, the, the side of the sea of the STEM subjects. Now the STEM subjects were identified by the government some time ago as those subjects which are going to be strategically vulnerable. Therefore, you can actually find, you can get a lot of funding for projects if it's related to STEM related subjects in schools. But computer science, I think, is that kind of silent C uh, within, within STEM. So the main thrust of the programme of study, um, every student should learn a bit of computer science. I'm with that. I've got a seven-year-old child uh, going through school at the moment. I want her to do a little bit of poetry, a little bit of music, a little bit of drama, a little bit of science, a little bit of history, a little bit of programming, a little bit of sport, a little bit of computer science. It was that kind of picture. Give them a flavour of something that is, that is meaningful for them and just light fires in their, uh, in their minds. You know, because they live in a digital world, it's a, uh, a, become a cliche perhaps. We live in a physical world, that's why we teach physics. Lovely example that a colleague of mine gives, you know, when, when, when a child jumps up, even from a very, very young age, they jump up, what happens immediately afterwards? Yeah. Why? Gravity. You know, we don't we don't leave our children sort of wondering why do I come down again? Oh, you don't need to know that. <laughs> you know, we actually do teach Newtonian physics from a very very young age. That's good, isn't it? Absolutely good. You know, I love the idea. You know, you know when a music when a piece of music is coming to an end. You hear it. You understand it. Why? I'll, I'll leave that to be rhetorical. 
you know, but the music education hasn't worked quite as well. But the whole notion of a cadence, the, 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 the end of a phrase, the two chords usually that govern how musical, the harmony that underpins a musical phrase at the end, and the tension that you feel just before this piece of music refers back to the main key chord is all due to one note. It's called the leading note. In the, in the eight notes of the scale, it's the seventh one, and it leads back up to that, that total point. That's why. And it's fascinating, so you can then hear it, you understand it. I think that's good that we should know that. We should know that. And then I love the example, I'm, I'll, I'll you can fall asleep for a minute, but those of you who know the um, uh, bit of the, the, the famous Tristan chord in Wagner's Tristan and Isolde, uh, there's a fascinating chord there. He kind of revolutionized the whole of music. There's, there's one chord in, 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 in Tristan's uh, uh, love music uh, that you've no idea where it's going to resolve. No idea. Of the Apollos to see. But it's having our understanding that world is just a joy. And we need to give that same kind of curiosity for the digital world. How does that work? Let's give them the answers. In the same way as the top of jumping now, we're coming down to the digital we give them the answers. It's about gravity. Once you understand that, you can see so much, so much else going on. And also fundamentally, this is from primary school. This is from primary school. So the first moment the children enter schools, age four, rising fives, they will be learning some computer science. Now we may not call it computer science in the same way that you know they do measuring. Well, we don't call it physics at that, at, at, at that stage. They do weighing and so on and so forth. You know we don't call it science then, but it is the computer science. I have a game that my seven-year-old loves to play with me. She came home from school with me and before bedtime. She wants daddy to close her eyes. My eyes, want daddy to go close his eyes, and she'll say, "Daddy." Will and so we have to walk on the stop, you know, turn left, turn right, and it's on, on, on the way up to bed. You know, what's the sequence of instructions? And it's an algorithm. And she's doing logo programming with me as a, as, a, as a physical device. And I think that's a wonderful thing. But that's what it is. And we do that from the age of four. When we get invent some of that, some of that thing. It's really exciting that she does it. So here we are. This is the result of all that history. You've had that wonderful heritage. Something began to go wrong during, during the 90s. We saw this sudden go, going through the floor. Let's transform our education system. The greatest and the good got together, uh, beat on the door of DFE and said, please listen, this is why uh, it is important. And they've listened. They've, they've listened so hard and so well, they've rebranded the subject that used to be called ICT. It's now called computing. It's a step change. It's a college of signal uh, for the DFE to say, this is something different. This is something new. And computer science has been added as the fourth science to the EMA. And these are the aims. Um, the aims for all pupils, every single one of them, from the age of four onwards, can understand and apply the fundamental principles of computer science. Wow. Wow. Including logic, algorithm. Data representation and communication. Secondly, can analyze problems in computational terms and have repeated practical experience of writing computer programs to solve such problems. Can evaluate and apply information technology, including new or unfamiliar technologies, analytically to solve problems and are responsible, competent, confident, creative users of information and communication technology. Those first two points, that's the computer side. That's a bit which is quite new. So it's certainly ambitious, and it's certainly challenging. One of the, uh, the Royal Society report and also the Next Gen uh, report did a study of the uh, post A level qualifications uh, in uh, ICT teachers. And it's something like, I know it's been recorded, if you get the, the, the statistic wrong, so that's a 34%. Of the ICT teacher that post day level qualification is something that looks like computer science. But that is to denigrate the work that they did at all. It's the equivalent, I suppose, that if somebody could find out I could play the piano, oh, you can teach A level music. No, I can play the piano. And for many of these teachers, they have worked so hard to get to grips with the ICT curriculum, even though they may be geographers or business studies uh, graduates or, or so on and so forth. They have done some wonderful, wonderful work. But that's one of the problems that faces our schools at the moment. The teachers now, how many of them have got a computer science degree or a computer science background? Probably less. 
and now we're putting in these rather radical changes. It's a bold move. You cannot underestimate that. It's really bold. Alternatives, just do nothing, leave it as it is, and still suffer the skill shortage, and still suffer the students that want to go into our subject. You know, you've just got to grasp that metal, as they say, um, and take it forward. So it's certainly ambitious. But something we have seen in schools is that, of course, the children engage with this. The children can do it. So actually, there's no excuse, to a certain extent, for the teachers saying, ooh, we're not sure about this, but they're scared for, for, for the they lack of confidence. And our role is partly to get alongside them and say, Chris, it's okay. You know, my seven-year-old plays this game as we go up to bed and she closes my eyes and we walk along and we do this. You say, and that's sequence of instructions, that's an algorithm, that's all that is. Oh, they say, forget it. It's about getting alongside them the way that I needed when I was first told you're going to teach A-level computing in six months' time. I need somebody to come alongside me and hold my hand through this and just give me the support and encouragement that I need. That you can do this. It's not rocket science, it's just computer science. We can't get there instantly. Sheila mentioned September 2014, the National Grid was coming in. Yes, and there's no doubt in many uh, school leaders' minds, and many head, uh, head teachers' minds, and some members of staff's minds, oh, I've got to get myself absolutely ready for September 2014. We're not going to be ready for September 2014. It's probably okay. we're ready enough to do the next term, and the term after, and so on, we will build. Add, add to our knowledge as we as we go through. David Brown, HMI for uh, ICT um, in uh, 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 Ofsted. In this program of study, it's a minimum requirement. There's more that you can be doing, but there's no doubt there's a real need to support and training across all key stages, and also some notion of trying to get uh, Ofsted to understand the journey that schools are uh, taking. So this is where we were. I'm sorry, I've probably taken longer than I should have tried to work through the remaining slides. There's a consensus that change was needed. We've now got that change. It was rather, it was serendipity, I suppose, that that change happened to coincide with when, or the, the views we expressed coincided with the government would consider a change in the national curriculum. So once in a generation opportunity, uh, which was taken, we walked through the door, we've answered the questions, and we've got what we, uh, what we wanted. It hasn't just been in computing at school, there's been deep, deep community engagement to make this happen. I mentioned a few around here, some you may have heard of, of course, the Garden of Pi, uh, you probably heard of, it's a wonderful organisation called Young Green White State uh, that take children off on weekends, so they do so sort of hack weekends using big data and solving problems and writing, uh, writing stuff in tandem with professional developers who come in and give up their weekends and have a wonderful time uh, creating some extraordinary uh, things. Next Gen Skills, I mentioned, apps for good, another, another outfit. Uh, developing uh, apps in, in schools and that whole kind of process very much again in hand in tandem in harness with uh, local industry and local professionals. Code club, there's now a thousand code clubs around the country. The idea here is that professionals uh, will run after school clubs in top end primary schools and they get given the resources and their senior managers say, You go and do that, that's a really good thing. We'll find our outreach, corporate social responsibility for business and industry. Code clubs are a wonderful way of just getting amongst the children and see their eyes light up as they get the machines to dance to their, uh, dance to their tune. So CAS, what are we doing and who are we? Uh, we're an interesting organisation. I always hesitate to use the term organisation. Uh, we don't have a big um, uh, shiny head office, or perhaps not going to be shiny anyway, but we don't have that. Um, we are collaborative partners with BCS. We started back in 2008 <coughs> just as grassroots volunteers teachers in the classroom, academics, just kind of waving a flag saying something's got to be done, what can we do? And the, and the picture uh, that we use is the, there are teachers in their classroom, they're kind of recognising something must be done, but what? I feel completely powerless, I'm just a teacher. You can, like, you can connect this teacher to another teacher in another part of the country, you can talk together, and you can share your ideas, and, you then, and then you build more, more, more uh, networks with other, with other teachers. So for us, it's about putting teachers in touch with other, other teachers and sharing ideas and, um, and, and sharing resources. Um, very grassroots. A couple of years later on, BCS uh, came on board. They're a membership organisation. That's good. They're the Charter Institute for IT. That's good. They've got, they've got, they've got the, the, the Royal Charter to, to support uh, computer science. That's good. What can we do together? And BCS have been absolutely fabulous in, in supporting the work of CAS. I'm now a BCS employee. Um, and we have the use of another part of member staff 
to look after the computer, the, the, the computer school room, and that's it. The rest of it is up to us. We have a lovely phrase in CAS, you know, there is no name, it's only us. So it's delightful when people will sort of kind of say to you, you know, I think CAS should be doing this. I think it's a really good idea. Can you? <laughs> I'm delighted to see some of you have picked up the, uh, the, the, the newsletter. Um, I've got this third hand. I hope I'm giving the quote right as I'm, as I'm being recorded uh, that somebody from the DFE said, this is the best newsletter that I've ever seen any subject association ever produce. I'm really proud of this. Because I have nothing more to do. <laughs> it's put together by, by teacher. Who at one of our meetings said, it'd be a pretty good idea to get a newsletter. Guess what, Derek? Well, no. <laughs> and he's just done it. And it's stock full of the most wonderful information, examples, lesson plans, ideas. It's absolutely terrific. He does this in his spare time. Absolutely amazing. Another, uh, another teacher uh, looked at, there's, a, there's an international, kind of Europe wide, really, uh, programming competition for kind of 11 to 14 year olds. Uh, it's called Bibras, or the Beaver uh, competition. And he said, it'd be really good, you know, if we could actually raise a bit of interest in the UK for the Beaver competition. Yes, it would, wouldn't it? Wouldn't you? And he did, and 28,000 students took part last year. It's just wonderful. Because people are gathering it and thinking, I can do this. And that's the kind of spirit that we, that we, that we have within computing the school. We can do this. We kind of need to uh, do it together. Uh, we're in a curriculum of the schools. You can find that on our website. But fundamentally, we're about supporting teachers uh, on the ground. Um, I wouldn't want to be one or two weeks. Yeah, there is this kind of picture. ICT teachers, they're not very good. They're quite happy with the status quo. They could teach computer science even if you wanted to. Well, you know, those aren't the teachers that I, that I, that I come across. These are deeply committed uh, professionals wanting the best uh, for their uh, for their children. Very few are happy with the status quo. There's a lovely one of our conferences. Uh, we have two examples before GCSE did, uh, did come onto the uh, picture for, for computing. One of the examples was going to go with a computer science uh, GCSE, the OCR example. That was great. That was good. The other example, AQA, said, well, I'm "Not too sure yet. You know, whether the teachers are quite ready." For this, we're just going to hang, hang back a bit. And you can just feel the kind of outrage from the teachers. And the quote that came up from the floor uh, was simply said that we're teachers, we can learn. We're in the business of learning. That's what we want to do. And we want the, the, the best thing for our, for our children. They're the teachers that I meet day after day after day. They want the best for children. They will learn. It's not easy for them. Let's not underestimate that. It's challenging. And we need to provide them with the uh, right structures. They feel isolated, they feel underqualified. And they certainly fit under the gun for results. But they're key. They're the very key. So, Cas, now we start to be full. Um, we've just hit 10,000 members. A thousand people are joining our online forum. Now, what that means is hard to say, membership or not. It's an online forum. We've got 10,000 members. But it's phenomenal growth uh, that you know, a thousand people seem to be joining every month because they're finding something that's of value. Uh, there through the online discussions, the sharing of resources, and looking at the events that we, uh, that we run. The lifeblood of our work is through regional help, so I'll tell you all about those uh, in a moment. You've seen the newsletter, its events, its conferences, all pretty much put on by volunteers. Okay, It's not kind of centrally organised, it's not me running all these events. It's folks like yourselves who think, oh, I did this. Good. Yes, and we'll give you as much support uh, as we can. Fundamentally, it's about building these grassroots uh, communities of practice. Um, I regard it like, like, like planting churches. I don't know what your uh, world of understanding of religion is or of churches that needn't worry too much, but it's as if, you know, we've got a very important message. And we want to go out and we want to evangelize about that particular message and gather people around us who respond to that message and want to help uh, further spread that message. Same idea with our regional help to a very important message about collaboration, about community, about supporting each other. With the community of practice, this group of people who share a common concern, set of problems, or interest in a topic, you can come together to fulfill both individual and group goals. That's really what our, the role of our regional help is. 97 at the moment, the 
regional hub is just a teacher opening their room up, having an evening such as this may be, usually starting at 4 o'clock, finishing at 6, a few times. Teachers come and share what they're doing in the, in, in the classroom, they network, they talk, and it's remarkably um, productive. There's quite an active uh, local hub here in, uh, in uh, Oxford. Um, it can be. Go along, find out what they do, talk to the teachers, find out how you might be able to get alongside them uh, and support them. We're very actively involved in professional development now. Uh, we have some funding from the DfE. Uh, we form something we call the Network of Excellence for the Teaching of uh, Computer Science. It's about finding those good teachers around the country to recruit them, to train them, get them up to speed with delivering effective CPD uh, to their colleagues. Um, so we have the Network of Excellence model here on the left hand side. We're also heavily involved with universities. Um, we have uh, Oxford University and Oxford Brooks are certainly members of our network of excellence where they are supporting their local teachers in ways that they uh, in ways that they uh, that they they can by cascading their, their knowledge down. We've got the Hub Online Forum, we run workshops, training courses, we're looking to model good practice, finding these teachers, we call them master teachers, uh, get them out of the classroom for half a day a week to support their local colleagues. And we're just beginning to work on the other two um, segments, action research, and actually getting the teachers to get engaged with research in their classroom, to understand the pedagogy of, computer, of, of, of teaching computer science, and also begin to run a small pilot offering teachers a certificate for saying, yeah, I understand what I'm teaching. This is of value. So our joining is uh, the, the membership uh, growth rates. Um, January 2014 was an extraordinary month. We can see the level of interest, the way in which it has has grown because it's got something very special about it, I believe, in, in its kind of community participation, uh, which is hugely valuable. Um, so, 90 plus regional hubs um, all over the country. I'll describe what those hubs are and we'll uh, move on. We run this online forum now, which for those of you who receive our members of CAS and receive their digest of the, uh, of the discussions that are going on there. Um, are probably shocked by the amount of stuff that teachers are talking about. It is just enormous, the number of people who are posting and uh, contributing. Um, we have something like, those of you who understand uh, online networks and social, uh, social networks in this way, the last stat I, I heard, we have 29% unique contributions. And most online forums, somewhere around 9-10%. We're three times better than that. It's just extraordinary to see the way that people are wanting to chip in, wanting to help, and wanting to uh, to support. And you can get a real flavour of what is on the teachers' hearts and minds by uh, going onto that particular forum and finding out what they're talking about. And if you do nothing else from this meeting, if you feel actually my life's so full, I can't possibly go into a local school, can't possibly find a local teacher to support, join the forum and just think, well, I can I can chip in with this particular discussion. Yeah. And this chicken, absolutely available for you to uh, do that, please, uh, please do. Events, um, I've just sort of picked up, what's it, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve events happening around the country between March the 6th and March the 10th. There's probably more underneath that I couldn't uh, probably uh, sufficiently with the screen space. Hundreds of different events happening all over the country, put on by volunteers, largely, just because So very briefly, I will, I will finish in a moment. This network of excellence for uh, computer science teaching, supported by DfE and BCS uh, directly, is has enabled us to employ uh, 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 some more staff to work specifically on the uh, network of excellence. The model is quite simple. Universities, they know in their computer science departments and their education departments, they know the stuff that the teachers need. So can we harness some of that expertise and some of that knowledge directly to run training courses, to work together with our master teachers to run training and CPD uh, interventions, and to work together with our volunteer communities uh, within the local hubs to provide the training courses, to provide the support, to provide uh, the network that teachers can access. It's built on three principles. The first principle is that they're face-to-face. You could easily say to me, oh, there's online courses, they can do an online courses, but most teachers are people people. They interact with people every day. That's their world. That's what they
they know. They want to see the whites of somebody's eyes and see their body language and read all that. That's what's important to them. Some will be quite happy doing a, a, a move for an online course. Yeah, sure. But the main thrust should be it's face-to-face -face, uh, communication. The second one should be local. There should, I see no reason why a teacher here in Oxford should feel they're going to give up a day's teaching and travel all the way to London to get, to get a day's training course. It should be available here. So that after school one day, they could they, they, they pop along for a meeting just like this. And they can kiss them and they can get what they need and they can meet people uh, that they um, can connect to and with. And the last thing is, again, I fundamentally believe it's teachers, teachers, teachers. But it's just a crime when there are others who are prepared to volunteer and do stuff. But I think we just need to be aware teachers can be a fickle bunch. Uh, I'm particularly fickle when I'm in your sort of situation, uh, listening to people. I kind of want to have some self, some, some assurance that the person who's helping me to become a better teacher actually knows what it's like on a wet Friday afternoon when the year nine have been, uh, been shut out of their ICT school. And it's a difficult lesson to manage. Kind of gives me a sense of, oh, I don't know what they're talking about. So I can, I, I can trust this. So the Network of Excellence built on those three models, where we can to collaborate with the university, yeah. with academics, with IT professionals, where we can to help support the teachers um, as well. We have a number of master teachers. It's a rolling program. We've said to the DfE we're going to find 400 master teachers by March uh, 2015. We've got just over 100 moments in both primary schools and secondary schools. And every time I, I, I show maps like this, I do worry about them and share. Um, if you know folks who you can share, you know, give them a call. Tell them to get in touch because they can share us looking a bit bereft of master teachers uh, at the moment. <coughs> we also invite the schools to sign up. This was fascinating. We said to the DfE, you know, we might get about a couple hundred schools to sign up to become, to, to join, to sign their school up to this network of excellence. Um, and we had about sort of six, six to seven hundred within the first six months. And really what this is saying is where the schools will say, yes, we actually believe this computing is important and we want to put our school on the map. We want to participate. Some of those schools have been invited to become lead schools. Now, you, you, you use the term excellent to many head teachers. They think, oh, I'm not an excellent school. Have a batch. Can I put something on the, uh, in, the, in the foyer? I want to sign up to this. With that, you know, they, they, so they can sign up to become a lead school. And part of that, part of their role is to well, you adopt another school, help them get up to this lead school status. Get engaged with your feeder school. Go in, get, release your staff to go in and work alongside the primary school teachers and help them understand what this curriculum is and so on and so forth. So with the badge comes a little bit of responsibility. Uh, but it's over one in seven of all the secondary schools in England have signed up for this. That's, that's, that's a good thing. It's a really good thing. University faculty are central to the success of the network um, as well. Uh, we need the subject knowledge, the pedagogical content, uh, knowledge as well. Uh, we encourage university colleagues to forge links with their primary secondary schools. I speak to Andy Early, who's doing that, have lots of groups, a lot of activity there. But just going into the schools to support them, find out what they need. Can I help? What can I do? Is there, is there a role for me here to, to help and support? Just ask that question. There's a number of documents. Um, some of you picked up uh, this document um, that we put into every single primary school. Uh, in the country. The program of study that the teachers have got is just two pages. Um, uh, it's quite dense. Um, this is 32 pages of explaining. This is what the curriculum is about. And when, my, when most primary teachers read this, you know, so they just, the, 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 the sense of relief. They go, oh, I'm doing that already. Yes, you probably are, but you just don't know the language. And, that, and that's all it is. Uh, we've worked on a second new one uh, at the moment. So here on the diagram, we've got the program of study in the left-hand side. We wrote a curriculum at schools before the program of study came out to say, you know, if there was a subject called computer science on the curriculum, this is what we think it would look like. Why don't we have a look at uh, have a look at that? The teaching agency uh, have also produced, you know, if you want to teach this stuff, this is what you need to know. And so we're basing all of the courses, the CPD provision, uh, are mainly on those three documents, as well as providing. You know, informative, uh, supporting information uh, for them uh, as well. Finding the certificates, I've explained that already. I'll just move uh, on from that. Um, but it's something I, I felt very strong about within CAS. Um, 
yes, I've got a degree in music, I've got a degree in computer science, I've got a postgraduate study in education to teach music and drama. I haven't got one for computing. I need one. If I'm going to work as a, as a teacher in school, because the other bit of the piece I haven't mentioned here that the government has supported is the opportunity to support through bursaries and scholarships, finding those good quality graduates, getting them into teacher training, getting them into the schools. So hopefully over time there is going to be a, a large cohort of highly qualified, um, uh, trained computing teachers. And folks like me who have come into the subject late will feel a bit of a poor relation. Well, this certificate is an opportunity to say to those teachers who have been working a long time in computing education in their schools, this is this is a value too. You can show that to your head, the job interviews and so on. That's a very important part of what we do. So we have challenges. Uh, last couple of slides. Um, this is the challenge. It's a near zero base. Huge opportunity. Let's not run out the door holding our heads and say we can't possibly do this. How can we introduce this? We need more money. We need more people. We need da 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 da. Yes, of course we do. But let's do what we can. Let's have the spirit behind it. Let's do what we can here yeah, in our communities, in our local schools. And it's, it's extraordinary how you can actually change uh, the mindsets of people by building that community, by building those uh, relationships. And our second challenge that we are uh, certainly now facing: equip, support, defer, encourage our uh, Computing teachers to teach computer science to understand uh, what that subject is. So here's some actions for you. Um, if you're working in the IT industry, as many of you I suspect uh, are, firstly, if you're a member of CAS, join. All we ask is that you provide us with a valid email. And the way you join, you give us your real name. And the friend you cannot join is Mickey Blue Eyes 44. <laughs> Whoever Mickey Blue Eyes 44 is. Uh, we want to know your real name and give us a photo because that, that's nice, isn't it? It's a good thing. You know, we can actually see who we're talking to. That's it. You know, I love it when I go on these online forums and you, and you talk and you chat to Mickey Blue Eyes 44 and you build up a picture of what they're like in their post, don't you? you whether you can travel them or not, but it's, it's have a picture of you, it's fine. You're not an avatar or not a Lego thing, but actually put your real picture on there, put your location. You know, the post can identify yourself, you know, so that when you do make the post, you think, we actually come back to you, we talk to you, we love up with you. It's an embodied professional network, it's ever so important. Uh, but do join counts, and then you get a real flavor of what the teachers are uh, talking about and what they're thinking about. Some of the discussions are really quite, you know, obtuse, high-end, deep computer science. Well, you can, you can chip in with that if your background and experience. And some of it is where there are teachers who are just starting their journey. And so, you know, be careful when you're talking in, in complicated terms, because some of us will then might pick you up on and say, I've got a clue what you're talking about. You can please rephrase that language I can understand because I don't get it. But that's okay. We want our students to do that in our classroom. It's exactly the same the same principle. Join CAS, sign up. You'll find an awful lot, awful lot there. Other things, there is a local CAS hub music here in Oxford. You find the details about it on the uh, in the CAS community uh, site. Pop along there. You can choose yourself. Maybe you volunteer to do, to do a short talk, share about what you do. What is computer science to you in your workplace? What are the principles that you're working in? And then the teachers would love to know, know about that because they haven't worked in industry. They haven't worked in, 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 in computer science in that way. So it's just helpful. It helps them to build that model of what it is they're trying to say to their, to their, to their children. They might even then volunteer you to come in and speak about your work to their pupils. They do that a lot with the students at the Hills Road. It was so useful. I mean, here we have a richness in Oxford. We have a richness in Cambridge. Um, but I could get the likes of Simon Bacon Jones and Tony Hall uh, to come in and give up the lunchtime to talk to my A level students. A level students didn't know who Tony Hall was, uh, but that didn't matter. It was just fabulous, that opportunity. You've got some of the great leading thinkers uh, of computer science uh, living just around the corner. We must be able to introduce them to some of our schools and get them in there to talk to the students and fire them up uh, with a passion. Become a Code Club volunteer. If your organisation, your uh, company, are involved with Code Club, happily put you in touch with them. CodeClub.org is their website. Just volunteer. It's a lovely thing to do. And, many, and what's, what's so beautiful about the whole nature of building a community of practice is that, of course, we, we know full well that when we give, we receive that all kind of biblical. Um, uh, uh, principle, that's absolutely true. These co-club volunteers find 
they learn more and they get more from the children uh, than they feel as if they're giving uh, to the children. And that's very much the spirit that transaction uh, takes place. You can help mentor a teacher. If you're a governor, a parent of a local school, why not pop in the second bit and say hello? And find out what they need and see if you can help. You might not be able to, but you know, ask a question and see what they um, and, and see what they might want. I've not mentioned CS4 Fun. CS4 Fun. Uh, again, if you're getting any website down tonight, csforfun.org, uh, cs4fm.org, uh, there on the, on, the fifth, on the fifth bullet point, it's a great place. You know, I'm sure some of us play, they, they play those old text adventures, you know, you're facing the door and you're going off. You know, that the, their, their, their website is built on that, on that principle. And inside every room, you'll discover, maybe there's, 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 there's a robotics room, and you'll discover lots of really interesting articles about robotics, and you turn them west, and you'll discover something else about, about uh, um, algorithms and magic, and then you'll turn north and you'll find something. It's just a wonderful website. Um, they also publish a, a, a magazine. Uh, but they also go and do schools talks. And uh, you can become a CS for fun uh, speaker. Uh, they, they, will, they, they will train. Uh, open a dialogue with the school head of computing, the head teachers, or the governors. Find out what they're doing. Is anybody a governor here at the school? Yeah. Do you know what they're doing in your school for computing? Yes. Good. Excellent. To a degree. Sorry? To a degree. To a degree. Okay. But it's about just opening up that dialogue. I do emphasize the word dialogue here. We're not sort of beating the door down and saying, you have to do this, you have to do the other, because we've been told to come in and tell you about this. You just find out what's happening. And see if there's a way in which we can just get alongside the teachers and, and support them what they're doing. After school clubs. Help interview would be computer teachers. I mentioned the scholarship scheme of BCS are running. A uh, number of large companies are involved in just interviewing candidates. Uh, and that's a very useful productive method of helping interviews for people to get involved in that. Uh, go into go visit uh, school classes. Perhaps if you're that uh, mindful, have a having a hack day, have a make a day, um, where you can open up in your organisation or off to the school. You know, I'll come along. Let's have a, let's have a making day. Let's get the children along, let's get the parents along, let's get the grandparents along, and let's make stuff, because that's the stuff that really uh, lights the fires in the hearts and minds uh, of our youngsters. So, the time is now, we haven't got much time to waste. September 2014, the clock is ticking, it is a long process. I'm, I've committed myself to be here for the long game, as long as people will uh, have me for this particular thing. It's not going to happen in the next six months, uh, it might happen in the next six years, uh, hopefully, it will certainly happen in the next 16 years. But it's a long haul, but it's a really exciting time. Um, the challenge is there, the curriculum is tough, the teachers are ready, they want to do this stuff, and there's an opportunity, I think, for us all who understand computer science and whatever we do to draw alongside them.